Okay, I think we can get going. Welcome back to day two and the final community journalism session for Radically Rural. For those of you who were not with us yesterday, I would like to once again give a shout out to Franklin Pierce University's Marlon Fitzwater Center for Communication and thank the folks there and their journalists for their coverage of yesterday's summit. Uh, the Sentinel produced a tab that these journalists um, did all the work on, and uh, they should be very proud of, of, of their efforts. And I also want to thank, again, the Knight Foundation for its generous support of this track by underwriting the in-person and online attendance of rural journalists. We're calling this session today Crazy Good, as it represents the best tools that you can use as a journalist to assist you in your work, the craziness of your schedule, and your skills as a journalist. We are joined online by Jeremy Kaplan, Director of Teaching and Learning at City University of New York's Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. Kaplan teaches classes, workshops, and webinars on entrepreneurial and digital journalism. He is a former Ford Fellow in Entrepreneurship Journalism at the Pointer Institute, a, we a Uyghurs Fellow at Columbia Business School where he earned his MBA, and a Knight um, Bejhat Fellow at Columbia Journalism School where he earned a master's degree in journalism. Jeremy, thanks so much for being with us today. We are absolutely looking forward to your suggestions on some tips and some techniques uh, that, can all, that can all make us better journalists. Jeremy. Thank you, Terrence, for that warm introduction. I am delighted to be with you all today. I wish I could be there in person. I'm a Bostonian. I spent a lot of time in New Hampshire and in the region. Uh, and would love to be there. Uh, and I'm happy to be there with you uh, in spirit and in ideas. And I am going to try to share some of what I find to be most useful as a journalist and as someone who is trying to find ways to work more efficiently, which we're all uh, continually trying to do. So I'm going to share uh, specifically tools and, and services, websites and apps in these four areas. First, um, focus on writing. That's the core of what we do as, as journalists and, and reporting. Uh, then I'm going to focus on some data tools and some tools for visuals and tools for, for creativity and efficiency. Before we get going, I just want to invite you to, to join in a, a quick little poll. Um, this is going to be a, a little interactive moment here if we can manage it. Um, I, I'd love you to share a word or phrase that describes what you love about journalism. I know we hear a lot of negativity about journalism. We're, we're worried about the future. We're facing a lot of challenges. But for the moment, what, what do you actually love about journalism. And, and to participate in this poll, you can just put your phone, point it up at the screen, and you'll see that QR code. Um, with your camera app, it'll open up uh, a link, and you can just answer that with a word or a phrase um, to share what it is that you love about journalism. Um, so I'll give you a minute to think about that. Um, you can also use the chat here if you're online and you'd prefer to, to do that. Um, but but uh, be great if you can use the poll. And I'll give you a minute just to think about that. It can, again, it can be a word uh, or, or a very short, short phrase. I'll give you a, a minute to reply, and then I'll see what, what, uh, what the replies look like here. Okay, I see some nice, nice replies. I'm going to share uh, share my uh, what I'm seeing here in response, and I see a few people still typing. So maybe I'll give you a moment or two further to respond. Okay, so here's uh, here's what I'm seeing, um, and I'll show you that in just a second here. Okay, so uh, building relationships, every day is different, learning, educating, knowledge, the local busybody, that's a great one, every day is different, change, building relationships, engagement, the story as service, meeting people, community, connection, people, um, some really great input here. Thank you for, for participating in that. Um, and uh, I may throw in a couple polls here as we go to keep everyone on their, 
on their toes. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and at the end, I'll ask you to share something that you find particularly useful with others um, uh, so that we can all benefit from the, the things that we each find most, most useful. Um, thanks for thanks for sharing those those inputs and uh, I'm gonna jump back into my slides here. Um, I'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so I'm gonna run through a lot of different things and uh, just briefly, I'm a teacher, I'm a journalist, I'm also a family member and trying to work efficiently is is uh, a, a reason behind my interest in a lot of these tools. I want to leave time for the rest of um, my life and and I think what I want to offer you here today, is a bunch of things you can choose from. You could think of it as a buffet, um, and, and I'd welcome that, uh, you to choose something um, that's useful for you. Even if you take one thing away that's useful for you, that will be a, a good, a good uh, result from my perspective. And I share more about these tools at wondertools.substack.com. It's my Substack newsletter. And actually, as a benefit to you, if, if it's useful for you, if you subscribe um, today, you'll get in your welcome email a summary of all the links that I'm going to mention today. So it's a quick way for you to go back and review anything you, you see today um, in case you, you don't want to write things down right now um, or you want to come back to something later. So if you subscribe to that, you'll get in the response the, the, a link to the, the full list. Um, and also further posts about many of these things. Uh, I, I focus also on helping journalists create new ventures around the world um, through this 100-day online program for journalism creators at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism here in, in the New York City area at the City University. Um, so a lot of these tools are also helpful for independent journalists or individual journalists or, or those working in newsrooms where they're juggling a lot of different things. And, and I hope you'll find them useful in, in, in either of those contexts. So as, as I said, that, that's the, uh, the handout, um, just wondertools.substack.com. I'll mention that at, again at the end uh, in case that's relevant for you. Um, just sign up and then you'll get a response with the, with the links. And you can also email me if something comes up uh, afterwards that you want to follow up on, or you can follow me on, on Twitter for, for other related things. OK, so these tools, just, just in terms of what, what uh, unites them, they're free for the most part. Um, some of them are freemium, meaning you can use them for free, but then there's a premium version. They're also easy to use. So my assumption is not that anyone is a techie, not that anyone is a professional engineer or web developer. It's just ordinary people. Um, I, I share these sites with my um, daughters sometimes when we're creating something together, or even with um, my parents who are older. Um, so it, it, they're not intended to be for, for technical people only. And also, that they have a specific application, each of them. So I'll try to explain what those are as we go. Uh, and as I said, just take one thing or take a couple things. Don't worry about uh, if, if things aren't relevant to you. Um, just pick what, what's, what's most of interest to you. OK, diving into the first category. I, I put these um, by time. So if, if we think about a day of, of work, of efficient work, at the top uh, here, in the top left, you'll see 9 AM. So this is how you might start a day. You might be writing, um, just putting pen to paper, right? And, and if you use pen and paper, that's great. You know, Old school is fine. Analog is great. Um, if you use digital uh, tools like a computer, a laptop, et cetera, I find these to be some helpful helpful resources, and, and I'll say why. Um, the first is IA Writer. And this is the simplest possible writing tool you could imagine. So a lot of the resources we're used to, uh, especially Microsoft Word, which has hundreds of different menu items, and even Google Docs, which I also like and recommend, they have tons of menu items. And oftentimes, that can be distracting and clutter up our view. So what I like about IA Writer is that it's a blank, clean screen. No menu items, nothing to worry about, just your words. You can have it focus on word by word, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph. So you can adjust the view slightly. Um, it has some other fancier features if you want to use them. For example, it will check for cliches. It'll check for grammar errors, spelling errors. It'll do some other things like uh, allow you to um, export into other tools that you might use and so forth. You can print and you can do all the usual things you'd expect. But the general view that I like is just the clean blank page. So it's a really nice, simple uh, piece of software for, for that purpose. Um, and uh, I use this often when I just want to get my ideas onto paper and I don't want to be distracted by any other, um, any other uh, distractions on screen. Um, OK, so uh, next up after that is Etherpad. So this is a, a tool, basically, that allows you to collaboratively work with a group of people. It could be just one other person, or it could be a whole group or a team that you're 
editing something with. And you can do that with other tools like, like Google Docs, for example. But one of the nice things about Etherpad is that everyone shows up in a different color. And so you can see who's doing what. It's free. It's completely free. It's open source. You can do other things, like you can scroll back and see how the do document developed over time. Uh, you can use it asynchronously. So one person can dro drop something in there. Another person can come in with their color and make additions. So it's just a nice, easy online editor for, um, for collaborative uh, document creation. Now, Google Docs, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with and have used. I just want to point out a few of the features that I find particularly helpful that some people may not be fully aware of. Uh, first, you can create a new doc instantly in any browser window just by typing doc.new. So rather than going to uh, open up Google Docs and looking through the menus and going up to the file menu, you just click doc.new in any browser, and you're instantly in the doc and can start typing. So I find that a particularly useful shortcut just because that's something I'm continually needing to do, create a new document. By the way, this also works. This trick also works in any other um, software uh, that Google makes, like Sheets. So sheet.new will get, open up a new spreadsheet you can dive into. Or slide.new will open up a new um, Google Slides presentation you can quickly start working in. Or um, cal.new for a new calendar item. Or drawing.new for a new Google Drawing item. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to use that, that feature. You can also type with your voice. I don't know about all of you, but sometimes at the end of the day, my hands get tired, or I just don't feel like typing everything, or, or I just feel like speaking and thinking out loud. And I want to look around the room or look out the window and just type some of my thoughts or type a kind of version of a first draft without actually putting my hands on the keyboard. So one of the things that's really nice is you just go to Tools, and you select Voice Typing within Google Docs. And it works really surprisingly well. It recognizes your, your, um, your voice without having to train it. It's a really, really great uh, contemporary tool for, uh, for dictation, basically, um, that, that works really quite, quite well. And you can, use, you can insert commas and, and uh, quotation marks and all that stuff with your voice as well. Um, but mainly, I just like the idea that I don't have to look at the screen all the time, and I can still be typing. You can add links easily. This is a little trick. You select anything in your that you've typed and hit Command K, um, or uh, on a Mac or Control K on a on a PC, and it will basically suggest what that link might be. So if you have a bunch of websites that you've been named and you don't know what the actual URL is, you can just highlight them, hit Command K, and it will suggest what it thinks the link is. So it's a quick way to put links into any document you're using. It has an automatic translation function a lot of people don't realize. So you can just go to Tools and Translate, and then it creates a copy in whatever other language you want. Now, of course, this is a GIST translation. It's not a human translation, so it's not going to be perfect. But in many cases, it's sufficient to just get started on, on something for someone else who may uh, prefer it in that language. And then, of course, they can uh, adjust it or, or edit it if they want to, or you can. Um, you can insert images. You can insert GIFs. There's a lot of different uh, things that you can insert to make your document more visual. Um, and of course, you can add annotations and comments. Um, this is a very helpful way to have a discussion on the side of a Google Doc if you haven't tried that yet. It's, it's a way that a lot of staffs are now starting to work um, collaboratively is to add these Google Doc comments and annotations. So those are a few. And then you can share and publish, obviously. So you can publish a document and make it available to your readers, for example. So if you have a doc, if someone's taking live notes on something that's happening in your area, um, they can uh, share that public that as a public document and then give the link either on social media or publish the link in an in a article that you're, you're publishing. And if you don't want to publish a very long URL right, with 100 different characters, you can go to bit.ly, bit.ly, and just shorten the link. You can even customize it. So you can say uh, it can be bit.ly slash uh, board meeting <laughs> September. Right um, and or whatever you want to call it, and then anyone who has that link can access the, those raw notes. This is the kind of thing that people can do in, in a transparency, service of transparency, sharing um, sharing information, notes, resources with uh, with readers, for example, or just within the staff. This next tool called Copy.ai is for um, a kind of artificial intelligence tool. Now, some people may resist this or they may not like it, and if that's you, that's fine. No pressure to try this. What this does is, is sort of get you past the blank page. So you put in some text, and it will automatically generate uh, as much text as you want on that topic. Um, it's, it's, a, it's sometimes a way for people to get past having this blank page and to get some sort of things out on paper. 
Um, it's sometimes used for marketing copy, so it can generate some marketing copy that you can use on social media, for example. Um, and uh, it's it's really a, a very interesting sort of next generation digital writing tool, um, not to replace writing, but just to amplify or assist the the process of getting from idea um, onto uh, onto paper. I want to talk next about some some tools for data, um, and and actually it moves beyond just just hardcore kind of data visualization to a few different kinds of of data. Um, I want to share with you something called Google Journalist Studio. Now, I'd love to hear if anyone uh, has uh, has used this before. I'd love your input on it. I find it to be a really helpful and and useful collection of resources specifically for journalists, and I'll give you a, a peek into a few of those. And then as we go along a little bit later, I may pop out onto the web and, and demonstrate them in, in real time if people want to see that a little bit. The first tool, that most important one, I think, from a journalism perspective, is called Pinpoint. So Pinpoint takes the, the kind of machine power of a huge, huge amount of processing computer power and puts it in your, finger, in your fingers, in your hands. And... Um, if anyone is doing investigative kind of projects where you're getting a big trove of email or you're getting a big trove of, of documents of whatever kind, um, you may be aware that you know searching through that is quite can be quite difficult. Um, these can be actually even handwritten letters or audio archives. So if you have tape, if you have the Nixon tapes of audio, or if you have an archive of email, or if you have handwritten letters that have been scanned in, any of those big collections of data, if you've gotten a leak of something, you can put it into Pinpoint. It gives you a huge amount of free um, data storage. And it also, in addition to just storage, it also will, will do uh, this incredibly powerful kind of search where it'll highlight entities, like names of people, places, things, um, organizations that appear, or places that appear repeatedly. And so you can, you can then sift through and filter just the documents that mention Cuba or just the documents that mention this certain person that you're writing about, this community leader, or just the documents that mention money, or, or whatever your, your kind of search interest is in exploring these documents. So it really is a great way to sift through and filter through um, huge document uh, sets that you have. But you can also use it for smaller document sets. So you can really use it for, for a lot of different things. Um, it has a, a really powerful way of organizing. You know, If you've ever used a Google search, which I'm sure we all have, you know how quickly things can be found uh, via Google. And this allows you to put that power into your hands in terms of finding stuff within your, your documents. Um, it can extract text from handwritten notes, right? So if you ever have scanned old letters, um, uh, you know, great journalists have often relied on sort of old letters and old, you know, handwritten documents, right? And and uh, this is a good way to to digitize those and then search them. Um, and and there are many many different kinds of projects that you can use on Pinpoint. If you if you actually explore the Pinpoint um, page within Google Journalist Studio, you'll, you'll see some examples of data sets and how others have have been using it to get you going. And it's free to use. The Common Knowledge Project is part of the, the Google Journalist Studio. And this basically allows you to look at data for your particular community. So you put in the name of your town or city uh, or area, and you pick a data set that you want to look at. And it sort of skips ahead a lot of through, through a lot of the otherwise boring steps to give you a, a view of that data that you can then download. You can revisualize it in whatever way you want. Or you can just capture that image and share it with your readers or, or viewers or listeners in a very simple way. So it's a really simple um, data sharing kind of tool. And within the Journal Studio, there are a lot of other um, tools that are helpful, like the da Public Data Explorer, which has even more data sets. And um, there's a, a Google Trends, which is a wonderful tool if you haven't used it uh, of late. It's a wonderful tool for comparing the interest people have in different topics and seeing what, what topics are, are really trending uh, around the country or around your region, even around your state or city. At the end of the year, so coming up in a couple months, Google will uh, issue a couple of reports about 2022 trends, and they'll highlight those on Google Trends. And so that's a good moment to check in with that. But you can also do it at any time, and you can put in any search terms you want or explore by, by location to find out what's trending in the area where, where you're interested in, in covering. So lots of, lots of useful um, resources in this Google Journalist Studio. One last one that I'll pull out to mention is Google Data GIFs. So, uh, or some of you may say GIFs. I know there's this 
pronunciation battle that takes place. Um, however you say it, Google has a nice simple way for you to, pr to present a simple piece of data in the form of a GIF so that you can put into an email or on a website or in social media or embed it into whatever you're publishing. Um, even capture it as a still image if you'd want to do that. In this case, I just did a quick one of music subscribers for, for um, Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon Music. And you can see here that Spotify is double, right? Double the size of Apple Music and Amazon, at least as of this data point. And, uh, but, but Apple is slightly ahead of Amazon Music, which is interesting. So that's just a little GIF that visualizes that. And there are various different styles of GIFs. You can use a horse race one for the, the chart for the upcoming elections, for example. There are a couple of different styles. And they're super easy. You don't have to program anything. You basically just plug in a couple numbers, and then the visualization pops up, and you can download, save as a GIF. Or you can get a link and just point people to that link. So nice and easy to use and fast to create. Here's another example. Here's the, the example of the horse race chart. This is for the percentage of people that pay for online news. So in Sweden, they're, they're very uh, generous with their payments for online news, apparently, the, the consumers. Um, you can refer to the Reuters uh, digital news report for 2022 if you want to see more of this interesting data about where people are willing to pay for. <laughs> For digital news. Um, in any case, this is just to illustrate that uh, that horse race style chart. And uh, next up, we have a different data viz tool. This is called Data Wrapper, and uh, I, I also like a tool called Flourish, which is a wonderful tool that also happens to be uh, in the uh, formerly in the Google Journalist Studio, although Flourish was recently acquired by Canva. Um, so. Um, in any case, Flourish is a wonderful tool. I know it was mentioned last year. So this year, I'm, I'm mentioning a different tool called Data Wrapper. And Data Wrapper is for making very simple charts, very simple maps, without having to study a manual or know anything about data, really. You just basically plug in um, a, a table, upload a table, or paste in some data, uh, or type it in, however you prefer to do it, whatever easiest, and instantly. You get really nice charts and maps, and you can download them. You can print them out. You can save them as a PDF or an image. You can embed them onto your website. You can share a link to them on your social media. You can pretty much use them in any way you want. You can even print, use them in print stories uh, or in video stories on TV. Um, it's a little harder on radio, <laughs> but uh, you can use them on your website if you have a radio station. Um, and this is Flourish, which I mentioned a moment ago, has a wider variety of different kinds of charts and visuals. So Data Wrapper is very clean and simple and easy, and it has a few types. Um, it has sort of the core types of tables and maps and charts. Flourish has a huge range, including three-dimensional visualizations and visualizations that stretch over a series of slides and variety of others. So it's, it's got a wider range, and it's a little bit more powerful, but maybe a little bit more complicated than, than Data Wrapper. Um, and um, you can see a little bit of that in this video. I'll just play some of this. ...on-brand visualizations, presentations, and interactive stories. It's simple. First, choose a template. Next, upload your data. And finally, use the settings to make it your own. From basic charts with added magic to rich data explorers that no other tool can create, to gorgeous data-driven maps, Flourish brings your data to life without coding, which leaves you free to amaze colleagues with stunning animated data presentations, or to engage audiences with data graphics on your website, or on social media, or at events. You can even integrate Flourish into your apps, dashboards, or CMS with our API for Live data. OK, so you get a, get a little bit of a taste of that. Um, and this is uh, the next one is Airtable. Um, this one is more for, I, I tend to use it more for internal um, analyses of things and looking at data in terms of um, kind of spreadsheet style data. But, but um, I also use it to share other kinds of things, um, other kinds of data. So I'll give you an example of one that I use it for. Actually, I'll put it into the, uh, the shared chat here. Um, it's a uh, Bitly slash podcast faves. And um, I'll show the example here, um, if I can open this up quickly. Um, I'm going to switch out the share. Uh, actually, do I have a slide here of that? Um, I'm going to switch out the, uh, there, there we go. So here's an example of one that I made um, uh, just of books to just illustrate how you can use it to show a different kind of data, right? These are entities. These are just books or, uh, in, the, uh, in the other case, uh, podcasts. Let me show you the. Uh, let me show you the example of the uh, podcast one just quickly. I'm going to switch the share here. 
and show you this podcast example. These are some of my favorite podcasts. So um, this is an example of organizing by category using Airtable. So this might not be considered, this wouldn't be considered a, a, a map, obviously, or a chart of the old sort that you'd see on Data Wrapper or, or um, Flourish. But this is a, a different kind of resource that you can provide to your readers or just have for yourself as a way of, uh, of organizing things. So that's done with, uh, with Airtable. And to use it, you basically just input the information in a spreadsheet. So that's as long as you're comfortable using a spreadsheet, you can use Airtable. And, and obviously, it can do a lot more powerful things as well. Um, people use it for project management. Some newsrooms, in fact, use it for project management, for example, um, instead of just a plain old spreadsheet or to manage the flow of stories through the cycle, um, you know, ideas, drafts, uh, edit stages, et cetera. Uh, it's very common uh, in some newsrooms to use it that way. But I often just use it to, uh, to show data in a more visual way. So shifting back over to my slides here from the live web back to the slides. Um, and uh, next up, we have the Night Lab Toolkit. This is from Northwestern's Night Lab. And uh, it is a phenomenal suite of tools. They're not brand new. Uh, they continually update them, but they're not brand new. But not everything needs to be new to be really uh, valuable and helpful to us as journalists and as people trying to create things effectively and efficiently. So what I love about the Night Lab Toolkit is that each tool is made to be used super, super simply and it's completely free. And then once you have the material, you can use it on your website. Again, you can link to it. You can use it in many different ways. And you can put these together in, in less than an hour, any of these kind of projects. Um, and they're, they're really simple. There's a, also great help information explaining exactly what to do and how to do it. So as an example, um, let's see if I can give you a couple examples of these. So Timeline.js is one of the tools. And what you do is basically you get a spreadsheet, a default kind of template spreadsheet that has default dates, default information uh, column, and then default link column, let's say. And you just update the dates, update the information, right? And update the links. And you've got your own timeline uh, for whatever it is that you're writing about. So if you want to write about um, the, uh, you know, the, the development of a particular candidate for office, right, that's running in your region, uh, you can pick a few dates, put them into the spreadsheet. Uh, pick a description of what was happening on those dates and then put a link you know, to a picture of the person or a YouTube video or a SoundCloud audio file or whatever else you want to link to, their website, their social account. And even with just a few entries, it's good with even you know, four to six entries as a starting point. You've got a timeline that someone can then click through and it has the visual. If you've, in, if you've embedded a YouTube, uh, a YouTube link or a Flickr link or a, a, whatever visual it is, a social media link, it's going to show that visual. It's going to play, have the text next to it and the date. And then per the person can click through it as an interactive timeline. So it's a really nice way to create a, a timeline, very easy to use. And, um, and you can use it in your website or, or, again, in your social account or wherever else. Story map allows you to put a, a story onto a map, as it sounds, um, so that you can show, for example, how um, something developed, uh, how these bugs spread, right? These invasive bugs spread from one area to another, right? And you, people can click through and see. And at each stop, you can have additional ancillary information. Another one is called Sound Sight. And these are all part of the Night Lab toolkit. And you can use any one of them independently of the others. They're, they're just a bunch of different things you can use. And Sound Sight allows you to put audio into, inside of a, a um, inside of a story online. Um, so uh, I, I can't really explain this without showing it. So I'm going to switch over here to show you a live example of this. And it's really a phenomenal, in my view, it's a really phenomenal kind of a tool. So let's see if you can see this. So this is a story about Tahrir Square, Egypt. And suddenly we hear the crowd was as large as any that is gathered in the square. <laughs> So hopefully you could hear that, um, and um, and and if you couldn't, it was basically playing the the audio from the good. Okay, so uh, it sounds like you could hear that. So if we scroll down here, um, you'll see there's a lot of other kinds of examples. Let me just play a couple of quick ones. This is a music story. So in the middle of the article, you're reading about some music. Uh, Now we can hear the guitar riffs, right? Or we hear this. This is a much more serious one. Um, okay. 
So this was a 911 call, right? And we can actually hear the sound of the 911 call um, inside the article. That's what SoundSight is about. And we just heard this one. Um, and you can see it's used. This is not a student tool, nor is this an amateur tool. You can see it was Times Magazine and McLean's in Canada. ProPublica used this tool, Washington Post, uh, radio stations, et cetera. So this is an Al Jazeera America. You can see the examples on their site. Um, so, so this is something that is not, again, just a, uh, a tool for amateurs or just something fun. This is a professional tool. Um, but it's also as easy as any of the other tools um, that you normally use. So if you're already using you know, Google Docs, Google Sheets, something like that, um, you can easily use this tool as, as well, sound sight. Um, so, um, so that's another example of one of the Night Lab tools that I, I particularly like and uh, quite, quite easy to use. Um, and, and, and on that site that I just showed you, there are some nice detailed instructions that help you navigate and, and figure out how to, how to do it and how to get going. And, and usually I've done it with students um, in the journalism school and they can get going very quickly. Here's Gapminder. Um, so this is a fun way to challenge your assumptions. Um, and um, actually, let's let's do a little a little example here. Um, gonna gonna uh, open up a tab here, and we're gonna play a little game to to illustrate this. Um, so the the link is on the screen. Up, upgrader dot um, uh, uh, dot uh, Gapminder dot org, and I'm gonna share a live version now. Let's let's test ourselves. I'm not going to embarrass anyone. Uh, you're just going to do this yourself quietly. And we'll see if you, you can you can uh, get get this. The goal here, by the way, is to under is to improve our understanding of data. Um, in this case of all these different UN goals and issues, global issues. So let's test ourselves here. How many companies in the world have a woman as top manager or CEO? So I'll look at the uh, the uh, text for um, the, the, the chat for if anyone wants to put a guest here. Um, and I'll, I, I will not uh, embarrass anyone in particular, but I'll put a guest in here shortly. I'll give you a chance to think about what you think the answer is. Does somebody have a guess here? Maybe maybe no one wants to share a guess uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, but uh, OK, so thank you for, for someone uh, put in a number there. So let's say 2%, we think. And actually, the answer is 18%. Now we get a little bit of insight. Um, female bosses are not rare any longer, but this common misconception can make women underestimate their chances, right? And then it gives us a little more data and gives us uh, some understanding of wh what other people think, right, around the world. And, and it gives us more background on this kind of misconception, right? So it's, I think it's an interesting example of using data in a creative way and uh, also educating ourselves on, on global issues um, from quality, uh, kind of quality data sets. Um, there, there was a question about um, uh, the uh, um, th where you can where you can start st uh, host the data uh, that Peter had asked. So let me just address that that uh, question briefly. And and actually the the uh, the details about that will be on the SoundSite uh, page, uh, SoundSite.nightlab.com. And you can see here you can choose basically a place to host. Um, and, uh, and there's a bunch of different possible places that you can use to host, really anywhere that you can host a, an audio file online. Um, and there are a lot of free places to host if, if you're, if you're um, not familiar with that. Um, but it goes into some more detail about that and gives you, gives you some, uh, some guidance. The nice thing about audio is that it's, it's such a small, oh, I didn't switch the tab here. Let me switch the tab um, for that share. Um, the, uh, the nice thing about audio is that it's, it's a small enough file size that you really won't have any problem with that. So here's the, here's the information area where it says um, you can basically put any of these audio file types onto a web server of your choice, so anywhere that hosts material, even like a Dropbox type thing. Um, and, uh, and then you basically just give it. You can also use it for, um, for uh, you can also use SoundCloud, which is a common uh, place to, to host audio. So. Let me just pause for a quick second and see what uh, what questions. And, and I see some other guesses came came across and 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 and, uh, and for that data question. So thank you for participating in that. Let me just pause here and see if there are any questions that have come up thus far um, uh, uh, in the in the in the sections that we've been talking about. Um, if you have a question, feel free to jump in in the chat. Um, 
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Uh huh. Please go ahead. So my name is Crystal Good. I have a small publication called Black by God, the West Virginian. We center uh -huh. uh, Black voices in West Virginia. And my only question is, are we going to get an email with these links? Yes. Yes. So if okay. you type, if you go to wondertools.substack.com, um, uh, there's a magic way to do it, which is just put in your email there, and instantly you'll get an email back. And in okay. that email back, it has a link to all these. Um, all of these tools, and actually, I'll show you what what that's going to look like. It's going to be this. Um, it's going to be this handout. Uh, so, um, so you see the screen here. This has all of the links, and this is actually made with a tool called Craft, which I'll get to later. And it basically will point you to all of the different tools that I'm mentioning, and and in some further articles about them as well. So, wondertools.com. Wondertools.substack.com. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll show it. I'll show it on screen again at the end if, if, if for anyone who's interested in that. Um, okay. So um, back to the um, back to the slide. So uh, we looked at Gapminder, and the next one is Our World in Data, and it's ourworldindata.org. I won't go through this in detail. Just to say they pick particular data sets, and you know sometimes I find data overwhelming. You, know, you go to a data site, you see thousands of data sets, and you just get overwhelmed. Your brain can explode, right? So for me, I like our world in data because they focus my attention on one particular data set, and they give me a good look at it and help me understand it. And as a journalist, I can then explore that data further. I can think about other ways to localize the data. So, so it's a really rich data source, but it's one that's manageable and useful and well curated, well edited, et cetera. Uh, you know, sometimes this stuff, this is just an aside. I love ice cream. And sometimes it can be like you've got, you know, 88 flavors, which is the number available at Morgan Stearns here in, in New York City. And uh, and sometimes that huge amount of stuff, whether they're data sets or ice cream flavors or websites, can be overwhelming, right? It's a, it's a wealth of, of, of riches, but it can be overwhelming. So so again, my, my, my plea to you is just to kind of focus on one thing that re resonates and that is relevant. And, uh, and take that away, and, and don't worry about uh, leaving other things aside for later. By the way, my, my, young, my uh, younger daughter often asks uh, when we go there, to, to, for, she used to, before she could read, uh, for us to read through all of the flavors. Um, and, uh, and then invariably, we'll just end up with vanilla. So, uh, so sometimes a simple tool is, is an effective one. OK, speaking of, uh, of transcription and, and, and dictation, which I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of tools for this. Otter.ai is a great one. It's one I've used for a long time, and it was mentioned last year. This year, I want to mention uh, one called Alice, because it's specifically for journalists. It's aliceapp.ai. You can use it for free at first. And there's no tracking. There's no ads. It's, it's made to be really secure for journalists. And um, one of the things I like about it is you can use it on your phone. You're interviewing someone, and you can uh, mark things without even looking down at your phone. And you can um, basically instantly send yourself the transcript or send others the transcript. It has a bunch of kind of cool features, but it's also just really good quality transcription in my testing. So I like it. I recommend it. And it's good for, for journalists. Um, if you're transcribing uh, a video meeting, so a lot of us are on Zoom quite a lot of the time. And increasingly, there are tools for, or you're interviewing people on Zoom, let's say. So Grain is a nice tool for grabbing highlights. Um, and you can then share those highlights with colleagues. You can grab transcript from just those sections. It's a good way to kind of get stuff out of the, the world of Zoom and back into uh, ways, uh, areas that we can use as, uh, as journalists. And uh, now we're up to 10.30 AM. So we've, we've done some writing. We've done some data. We've done some transcription. It's 10.30 AM. We're now uh, going back to our notebooks. And I don't know what kind of notebook each of you uses. Uh, we all use different notes. and. Everyone has their own way of, of taking notes. So I want to just kind of point you to a couple of things that I think are happening in the notes world uh, to make things maybe a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient. Um, and one of them is um, this idea of bullet style notes. Um, Workflow is an example of this kind of approach. It's a free tool. At, everything is organized around bullet points. And one of the nice things is that, like some of these other tools, there's backlinking. So anytime you mention something, um, with a hashtag, you can find all of their mentions of that on a single page together. Um, and it works on mobile. It works on desktop. The, the tool I actually use as my primary notebook now, digital notebook, moving on from Evernote and the sort of earlier generation of hierarchically organized notes, where something is in a, a notebook, 
right? There's an individual page and a notebook that's sort of the old framework. Realm is, is a flat system. That means that you start with a blank page and you tag things. And so anytime you tag something, you can see all of the entities that have been tagged with that thing on one page. And the reason for that is, let's say we're having a meeting or you're interviewing someone. Um, and in your interview, you're talking about um, the community school board. And so school board might be one tag, but there might be something um, that comes up about a certain person, Jones, right? A, a detail about how Jones manages this, right? And then something might come up about um, the budget. And then something might come up about what Sam thinks about this issue and how Sam has complained to other people, right? And you might be working on something about Sam and also something about Jones, and you might be working on something about the budget, right? So this meeting, this discussion, right, could be in any of those four places, in those four notebooks. If you, if you organize things by notes or note pages or notebooks, where does that go, right? So with Rome, you don't have to worry about that because you just add the little hashtag for each of those entities. And then when you're looking at your budget story, you see all of the meetings and mentions of budget across different things that you're doing, right? Or you're looking at Jones and you're all you're reporting on Jones and you've got all of the past mentions, right? This is called backlinking and it's a way of organizing notes so that one note doesn't have to be only in one notebook, right? Um, because that note might mention several entities that are related to different kinds of projects. So that's the basic uh, idea behind this new form of note taking. And there are a lot of different tools that allow you to, to do this. Um, Rome is the one that I use and, and recommend. Um, but mem.ai is another example of, of one that does this. Obsidian is a popular new one as well um, that's free and open source. So there's a lot of different tools that do this. And um, it's not for everyone. You know, Some people like the traditional style notebook where you just create a note and put it in one notebook. Um, but in my experience, that often limits people and makes it difficult when you're uh, trying to, to find things and use them later on. Moving on to social media. Uh, I'm happy, happy to talk more about the notes thing later if people are interested in that in the Q&A. Um, moving on to social. So I'm not going to give you a lot of social sites um, because I want to make a push for spending less time on social media. Um, but, uh, but there is one that I find useful, um, in particular that people don't tend to know a lot about, which is called Wakelet. And this is not really so much for exploring social media. There are many tools for that. It's instead for collecting it. It's kind of scrapbooking it. So let's say you, uh, your local high school team won a major award or a major prize or a major competition of some sort, um, or a science person won a science award in your, in your local area and you want to highlight that. Well, one way to do that is to look on social media, and then you can basically scrapbook things. You can select things um, through Wakelet, and you create a beautiful page that shows tweets and YouTube videos or um, things posted to, to, um, to Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or, or wherever they're posted online. And, um, and you can put together a, a basically a scrapbook page made of social posts that you can then share on your social, you can publish it, you can share a link to it in your article. Um, you can basically create a scrapbook of social content. And it can also just be for your notes, right? So let's say you're reporting on the local mayor and you're gathering info about different things people have said. You can create essentially a social scrapbook where you grab stuff whenever you see a related tweet or a, 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 um, a YouTube post or even a web, web mention. You can use put web stuff in there as well. And you basically create this, this uh, elegant looking and organized looking scrapbook of all of those mentions and they're live links, right? So later on you can go back and open up any of those tweets or articles or whatever. Um, and it's a nice way to organize all of that stuff that appears on social media that's otherwise fleeting and, and just dis disappearing um, very quickly. So for organizing your work, um, this might happen at 3.30 afternoon. It might happen really anytime. Um, I, I really like these new tools. Um, these are tools like Craft, which is the tool I use to create the handout that uh, that's available to you that I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, uh, shows all of these sites from today. Um, and I created a book list also. There's a link to that on the screen, uh, books I, I want to read. Um, you can use it really for any kind of notes. Um, here are a couple of uh, uh, visuals that show you what the interface looks like. It's basically a, a beautiful way to organize text, to share text. Um, you can use it as a notebook. I tend to use it more to publish or share resources with people because I like the beautiful ways in which you can publish things. 
And it's free to students and teachers, by the way, um, but it's pretty low cost. I think it's $20 a year if you're not a student or teacher. So it's not an expensive tool. And you can use the free version. It has most of the same features, actually. Um, so it's just a very nice way to uh, organize material. It works well on, on um, mobile, also on the web. Uh, there's a uh, new Windows version. It works well on uh, Mac. It works pretty much on any, any device. Um, very easy to, to start using and very elegantly designed. Another one you may have heard about recently because its valuation has climbed to $10 billion. It's one of the hot tech companies these days. It's called Notion, notion.so. And um, it's funny, the URLs you might notice, craft.do, notion.so, coda.io, right? These are all the new, it's a new lingo of this new generation of web tools. Notion.so is basically an all-in-one kind of a tool for creating documents, for creating simple databases, for creating all, all kinds of pages with mixed information. You can use it for a lot of different things, but what's nice about it is it's really easy to, to, to use. It's not um, something that's super complicated unless you want to use the most powerful features, and you can use it for free. So it's, a, it's one that I would encourage you to explore. I've written a couple of entry point posts about it um, in Wonder Tools, how to get started with it. If you're interested, I'm happy to, to share those with you. Coda is another tool. These are basically next generation Google Docs, right? So Google Docs just works for, for text mostly. These work for organizing spreadsheets and presentation kind of materials as well as uh, research materials. And um, I've used it to create all sorts of different kinds of things, um, including syllabi for a course, right, where it has multiple subpages or um, presentation materials where you've got seven different things you want to explain, and there's a page for each of them. One of the nice things about Coda is that you can embed um, material into it. So a Google Doc doesn't allow you to embed a video in it, right, like you can on a web page, or it doesn't let you embed a map or a tweet. You can take a picture of that and put the picture in, but Coda and Notion both let you embed the actual content. So if the content is updated, um, that, that material will be updated on your Coda page or your, on your Notion page. And it also allows people to interact. So you can ask people to vote on things or to add comments to things. Um, and multiple people can contribute to it right on the Notion page or on the Coda page. And the, the um, power of that is really making things interactive if you're collaborating on a team document. right? We're planning an event, uh, for example, internally here at the school. And we collaborate on a Coda document. Right? People can add different pages to it. They can interact with the data, with a schedule, et cetera. All that can be done on a free uh, Coda document. Um, and it, by the way, for more advanced users, it can integrate with other tools. So if you use Trello for your scheduling or, or, or um, task management, if you update something on Trello, it can automatically be updated on your Coda. Or if you add something to Coda, you can link it to Slack. So it updates a particular Slack channel about a story that you're collectively working on or something like that. So there's different ways to use it to interact with other tools that you're using if you use multiple tools. Um, one other one in this category I'll mention is Haystacks. This one I love because it's just about discovering the most useful, most interesting public Google Docs. So it turns out that people have created all sorts of interesting public Google Docs, for example, salaries right, in different industries, and they've made those public, or people who have been uh, harassing people, right? This was uh, this was a big story a couple of years ago, um, before the Me Too movement exploded. People had created a spreadsheet of people who were known to be harassers and kind of warning other people away from those um, organizations. And however you feel about that, um, the the point is that Google Docs are often where people are sharing public information or making information public. And so, as journalists, it's useful for us to be aware of that. And Haystacks is a place, it used to be called Sourceful, um, now it's called Haystacks, and it's a good place for basically just searching around for public documents, spreadsheets, and presentations um, that might be of interest. Moving on to visuals. Um, so visuals are, um, are something, whether we do them at 11.30 p.m. at night or in the middle of the workday, we, we, we at some point need to think about how things look visually. And these are some tools that I find particularly, particularly helpful. Um, we need to grab people's attention. Um, they're, they're stuck to their phones or they're looking at 50 different tabs. So, um, so we need to, to, to grab their attention. Visuals often help us do that. Eagle.cool is one resource that I find particularly helpful for organizing all of my images, screenshots, things I download from the web. It allows me to keep all of that in some kind of organizational 
consistent way. And by the way, you can use it not just for images, you can use it for PDFs and for really anything on your computer. Um, the computer itself, in, in my experience, has an organizational system that leaves something to be desired when you're searching for things. And Eagle really helps um, make things a lot, lot easier to, to find. When you're looking for illustrations, which sometimes we want to use instead of photographs, blush.design has a really ingenious approach. You can start with a particular static vi visual. And these are all free to use, by the way. Free to use. It's Creative Commons. So you can, and you can, you can use it in any way you want, basically. Um, and then you can customize it. So you can have the, the figure doing something different or adjust the number of people in the scene. So it's a nice way to create um, a, a, an illustration if you don't have a budget for professional illustrations. The one I use and recommend for individual websites or for creating a, a quick page, if you're trying to create a page for a, a story or your own portfolio site, for example, this is what I use for my portfolio. It's called Tilda. It's tilde.cc. And what's great about it is that it's, it's a bit like Squarespace or Wix or Weebly or any of these other kind of tools for making web pages. But I think that, that it's better for a couple of reasons. One is the templates I find more professional looking, more clean. And the second is that the blocks, these modules, allow you to just drag in a part of a page, like a header, and then you just adjust it, and then drag in a different set of uh, uh, an image gallery. And then you can basically just change the text or change the images, and you don't have to design the whole page, nor do you have to use one fixed template. So you can use a bit from different templates if they suit your purposes. So you can stitch together a site that resonates with you and makes sense for you, and you can continually change it as much or as little as you want. Um, it's free to create a simple page. Um, and then if you want a more advanced page or more features, um, it's typical. It's you know priced typically for web hosting kind of services where it's about $10 a month. I believe I pay $20 for five sites to host five sites and design um, five sites, which is a, a very reasonable cost and competitive with other web hosting services like Squarespace. Um, I think we'll skip past that video. One other tool for creating visuals that uh, might be useful to you and, and at some point, um, whether you're creating a logo, this is an example. You're seeing me on screen creating a logo for IRE, for example, just as an example. And whether you're creating a logo for an event or for a project, let's say you're reporting on the election, you want to create a little logo for that, uh, for that process or special thing that's happening locally, uh, or whether it's a logo for your, your you know, yourself or whatever it is. Um, you can basically type in the name of yourself or the company or the organization or the project. You can give a tagline. Then you choose icons like I'm doing here. Choose a couple of icons, and you can choose as many as you want. You can search for a particular kind of icon. And then basically it's going to spit out a whole bunch of different options that you have. And then you can mix and match and customize it further, and then you can download it. You can start using it. So in a matter of minutes, you can have the results. Um, uh, and uh, here's what the results might look like um, once you're done uh, playing around for a minute or two. And you've got tons and tons of options. And then you can click through and edit them. You can add the tagline or take it away or change the background or do whatever you want to customize it further. But in a matter of minutes, you know, without paying a professional logo designer, you get a lot of different kinds of options. And if you do have the luxury of hiring someone, you can then take a few options and send that to the person say, these are some that I like. So you can use it as a starting point. If you're doing mobile visuals, so a lot of us are using phones. I'm very eager to get the new iPhone. I still have a very old phone. I'm going to get the new one soon. Um, and uh, if you're using mobile, whether it's an Android or an iOS kind of device, a few tools are essential, um, both for, for journalistic purposes but also for personal purposes. Google Photos is one. It's uh, completely free. You can back up all of your photos and videos. Um, you can find anything, even if you haven't tagged or organized anything, you can just type the word in sn snow or the word if, if you're in uh, New Hampshire looking for your snow shots of skiing or whatever, or birthday, or forest, or cat, or any other term you want, and it will find all those photos. Whether or not you've tagged, you haven't, don't have to worry about tagging them, just using its intelligence. Um, if you've named people in your photos, which you can do um, pretty easily, it will start to recognize them automatically, and then you can just type in someone's name, and it will find you all their photos. So I've done this to make a, a like a birthday slideshow for someone, for example. Um, you, can, you can do it very, very quickly and easily. You can also do other advanced things. You can make collages. You can make little videos automatically by choosing some photos and pressing movie. It'll make a video for you. Um, you can make animations. If you want to make a GIF, you can just put a few images, select a few images, tap them, and click, 
animation will make an animation for you. Um, you can also make an album. So this is where the journalism part comes in. If you want to make an album and invite your readers or your community members to share to that album, you just give them a link. And they can add their photos for the first day of school or the first snowfall of the year. Or they can add a photo of their pets or whatever it is that you want to share as a community thing. You can just create an album. Uh, if you want to put a few photos in it to get it started, you can do that. You make the album, you go to settings, you make the album public and make the settings so that other people can add to it. And then you share the link. I've done this with groups of people where we get all the people in the room sharing photos uh, of something and, and it just takes a, a couple minutes and then suddenly you've got all of these photos. And because it's Google, they've got a lot of computing power. So when you're looking at those or showing those, it, it's pretty quick to, re to respond, even if a lot of people are adding things. So there's a lot of different ways to, to use this. Um, and, and I recommend it. it works very, very, very well um, in my experience. And it works on the web too, so it's not just a mobile tool. You can do this all on the web, and you can do it across any kind of device. Um, so these are some of the things that I just mentioned, um, the advantages of, uh, of Google Photos. Another tool I really like is called Waterlog. This is a different kind of tool. This is for turning photos, which often can be rudimentary, right? If you just have a photo of the high school building or a photo of some town industrial facility that's coming up in your town or something like that. It might not be beautiful visual as a photograph, but sometimes we can turn them into these illustrations automatically, which give the, the visuals a different feel, right? One time we, we created a podcast about a class, um, the, the journey of a class that, that, um, that I was involved with a few years ago. And, and as the thumbnails, rather than having photographs, we just decided a consistent series of these kind of illustrations, right? Photo illustrations would make a nice consistent brand identity for that. So you can use it in that way as well. Um, it's very easy. You just input a photo, and then you can customize exactly how the illustration looks. There are a lot of other tools now that do this kind of photo illustration automatically. So there's a lot of different options. Ollie is another one that's nice. Um, and uh, Tin Rocket is the company that makes this, and they make a few other nice tools out of, uh, out of Brooklyn, actually. Quick, uh, which is now owned by, by um, GoPro, the company GoPro now owns this, um, but it's free to use across different platforms. And whatever video you have on your phone, if you have old videos of your family members or of people and things in your town, it'll create an algorithmically create a video for you. It's almost like a music video that's really quite quite exceptional in quality. And, and uh, then you can customize it. You can add text. You can customize it. Um, it's quite a nice result and quite a nice product. Mojo is the last one in the series that I'll mention. This is for vertical video. It's a French company out of Paris, and they have a beautiful uh, way of, of enabling you to create vertical videos, which is all the rage online these days. Um, and uh, really nice tool, very easy to use. Um, you can you even use it for kinetic typography, kinetic text. If you look at that third image in, in, in this screenshot here, you'll see that it's text-based. And so you can create just a text graphic about something um, with moving text images. It's almost like it's basically motion graphics without needing to have a motion graphics designer. You can just design it with the app. Um, and you can see some examples of the kind of look and feel of this. Um, it, it, it's, the examples they use are kind of stylish and fashion and that kind of stuff. But you can use it for really any subject. It could be uh, you know, news business kind of stuff as well. It's just that the more common uses of the app tend to be on these kind of pop culture stuff. Now, diversifying our images is really important. Um, and, uh, and to that end, we can look at a range of different tools. I just tweeted a, a, a tweet thread about this a couple of days ago about all how a majority of images um, in uh, museums have been painted by white males and a majority of images of people in, in movies are, are white males, et cetera, um, are created by white males historically. And yet there's a lot of tools now that allow us to diversify the images that we use. And here are a couple of examples, um, humans, it's a strange name with three A's, but it's il illustrations, again, like, like Blush, which I mentioned earlier. Black Illustrations is one specifically um, along these lines. Center for Aging Better is uh, for showing positive age images of, of people older, uh, older part of their lives, um, tackling these kind of stereotypes of, of, uh, of older people. So there are lots and lots of, of resources that uh, enable us to change the kind of images we're using in our, in our web presence and online and social, et cetera. A couple tools, finally, for, for multimedia, moving multimedia. Capwing is one that uh, I really like for web-based video editing. You can turn something into a GIF. You can add, uh, lay, you can lay text over a video if you've shot something 
that you want to lay some text over easily. It's just a very easy to use web-based editor. If you've never used Final Cut Pro or Adobe um, uh, Premiere or, or After Effects or any of these fancy tools, you don't need to, um, to if you're just making a simple little video um, or making a GIF or, or something like that. So this is a simple and, and free one to get started with. And then Genially. So this is an interesting one in the sense that you can add popover effects. So if you want to show a diagram of um, something in the town, right, this new town center and all the different buildings that are popping up, you can uh, upload a photograph and then drop in hotspots on top of that photograph. You just click on them and then add a picture to that hotspot. And then when somebody goes to that page, when you make it public, they'll be able to, to um, hover over that spot or click on it and it will pop up a picture or a video or an audio file about that place. So you can kind of create an interactive tour of something without having any complicated code, just very easy, easy to use kind of a tool. Finally, when you're pitching ideas internally, again, using visuals potentially, um, there are a couple tools you can use for that for making really impactful slides. So set aside PowerPoint um, and use a tool like, like one of these. Beautiful.ai is one that I really like. Here's an example of it in action. You take a bit of text, and you can um, move things around. It'll automatically reflow a page in a variety of different ways for you. It also has these amazing array of templates for different kinds of data. So you can have three things in a set, like these three people, and add a fourth, and it will reflow everything. Or have these four data points and change them into a chart instead of a pie chart. Or change the number of people uh, to, have to compare men and women, um, as you're seeing on screen. Um, or add a different view to this kind of chart. So it's got a lot of different visuals that are very easy to manipulate, and they look really professional, and they're really easy to use. I also like using pitch.com. This is not one of the newest tools in terms of presentations. It's good for collaboration if you're working with a colleague to make a presentation. But it also just has a beautiful set of templates. So if you don't have a designer or you don't feel like you're a designer, you can just pick one of these really nice templates. They're not all cartoony like this. There are many that are very, very professional looking. And you can just start with that. And you've got a good way of the uh, your, a good way towards um, having a, a great slide deck. And again, you can use it completely for free. Here you can see an example of how the interface looks. Very easy to use, very, very kind of user friendly, and very professional and clean kinds of looks. The the Google Slides templates to me look often cartoony and kind of uh, amateurish, and these are much more professional looking. Um, Canva also has some wonderful slide templates. Um, Canva just announced a whole bunch of feature upgrades. You can now build websites with Canva. You could do all kinds of things um, with Canva now. It's a really powerful tool for design. and uh, But the slides are, are one of the nice elements where they have some really nice, simple slide decks that you can just take and customize. So uh, we're getting towards the Q&A period. Um, and uh, let's take a, a sort of uh, a stretch here. Um, if, you're, if you've been sitting for a while, you've had a long day, um, let's take a stretch break. And while we do that, I'm going to show you. You can stand up if you want, or just roll your shoulders, or whatever you need to do, wherever you're sitting or standing. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of tools that I, I like using for, for a break, a mental break, um, and a physical break, um, or just to relax <laughs> along with these, uh, these kitties. One is called Seek. So this tool I like using with my family. Um, we, if we're going for a walk and we see something we've never seen before, an, an amazing animal, a bird. Um, we, we've been in a, we were in a rural area for, for uh, 18 months during the pandemic. And we'd go on these long walks and see things we'd never seen before. And, and you could just point your phone at it and it tells you what it is and gives you some, some really nice insight about that particular plant or that particular animal. It's called Seek. It's completely free to use. It doesn't collect any data. And it gives you some really nice insight, scientific insight into um, whatever it is that you're seeing, an animal, a bug, a plant, anything. And it's, avail it's available for, uh, for Google or for, uh, for uh, iOS. I'll just show you this for a quick second while we're in our break mode. So you see someone pointing at something, and it just recognizes it automatically. It has this amazing ability to just recognize whatever you're seeing. And if you want to, you can gather more information. You don't have to, but you can now look at more information about that, um, for example. So it's identifying it. And then you can sort of keep a collection of different things that you've seen over time, which is kind of fun. So that's a little example of how it, how it works and, and what it does. 
um, for exercise in the middle of the day. I don't always have time to go to a gym or anything like that. Um, I don't know if I'd want to go to a gym these COVID days. But um, what I often end up doing is just using a, a little app called Wakeout. It just gives me one minute little stretches at my desk. Um, it gives me a, a way to do a quick exercise wherever I am uh, for two minutes or five minutes or 30 seconds. It can remind me if I'm just in the middle of working just to take a break every couple hours and, and stretch. And it's a really beautifully designed, very nice, simple app. Um, another one for, for kind of mental strength that I've enjoyed uh, since the beginning of the pandemic is called Healthy Minds. Um, this is from some neuroscientists. It has uh, Columbia University backing. It's a, it's a pretty serious and well-organized um, series of little short audio um, pieces. Um, some of it's about mindfulness. Um, it's it's uh, really about kind of keeping your mind healthy just as you keep your body healthy. And it's done with a really, really high quality professional approach. And you can customize how long you want to listen to something. You can listen to a five minute version or a 20 minute version, um, depending on how much time you have available, which is quite handy. Um, this is also one that might not be for everyone. <laughs> this is one where if you just want someone to, to vent to or to get something off your mind, you can talk to a little robot for free called Wobot. And for, you know, given the mental health crisis that we're seeing in this country right now, a lot of us sometimes need someone to, to talk to. We don't always have a therapist we can dial up. So um, not that the robot is going to replace any human therapist. That's not the point. It's just a chance for you to get things off of your mind and to have a place to, to kind of put them. And it gives you some prompts and some questions to, to build on. If you are distracted, and that's leading to a, a challenge for you, there are a couple of tools I'll recommend on that. One is freedom. So it blocks stuff that you're not interested in focusing on or that's, that are pulling you away from your, your work. Um, very easy to set up. And once you've set it up, it will kind of block things for you. You don't have to actively manage it. And the other is called Forest. This is a little app that will grow trees as you focus. And if you start doing things you don't want to be doing, you're going to ruin your trees. So it kind of gives you a positive incentive to continue focusing. If you are listening to podcasts, I, I showed you my podcast list earlier. Uh, bit.ly slash podcast faves. And, uh, and the app that I use is, is called Castro. To me, some of the great work in journalism these days is being, doing, is being done in the podcast realm. And um, Castro allows you to keep one simple queue. So you, you can download as many podcasts, subscribe to as many podcasts as you want. And then all of those new episodes come into this, into this um, open inbox, right? But it doesn't actually download unless you choose the ones you want. So that's a nice feature. You get all of them, all of the new things you subscribe to, all of them have different episodes coming out every day or every week. And then you just point to the ones you want. And those are the ones that go into your queue that you can actually then listen to. So it's a nice staging way to move from the sort of inbox where you might get overloaded if you subscribe to too many things. Instead, you get a queue, which is just the ones of the things you've expressed interest in, just the episodes that you actually want to listen to. And it's one single queue. So I find this a really nice way to listen to podcasts. If you're on Android, Pocket Casts is a great alternative. Um, very similar kind of approach and very similar free, free app for podcasts. And if you haven't gotten into podcasts yet, it's very easy to start. You can just open up either Pocket Casts or Castro, and it'll help you pick out some ones that, that interest you. Um, or you can use some of these, uh, the ones that I just mentioned or that I like um, to, uh, to get going. As you're planning ahead for the next day, um, there are a couple apps that I like to use. I actually wrote about these uh, sorted today in, uh, in, in Wonder Tools. And um, what it does is basically allow you to put in a bunch of tasks, and then it auto schedules a day for you. So given these tasks and given the meetings you have, here's what the schedule might look like, right? Then you can move it around or change it. But it's a nice way of sort of looking at how much you, time you're actually going to have and how many tasks you can actually, actually do, and sort of automatically creates a, a schedule for you like an assistant might do. Calendly is great for allowing people to put time on your schedule only when you're actually available. Um, but there are a lot of alternatives, including free ones. Um, Cal.com is a new free one. And, um, and there are other ones if you're working with a group, trying to find a group time, like whenisgood.net or youcanbook.me or Doodle. Um, Cal.com is the newest one that's totally free. So that's a good one if you're just working independently and wanting to let people put time on your schedule without the back and forth of 10 emails right, to figure out when is good. Right, you just send them cal.com that you've already set a few times you're available, and then they can pick the one, and you both get the calendar invite, and you're all set. Clay is an, an interesting one um, because it's 
basically helping you with relationships. So you probably have hundreds or even thousands of people in your life who you've gone to college with or worked with or used to know at camp or used to partner with or, or play tennis with or whatever it is. And a lot of these people drift out of our lives, right? And so what Clay does is look at all the people that you have relationships with and it tells you, hey, this person just posted something on LinkedIn about their new career or this person's having a birthday. Or you said that every three months you want to reach out to this person who, you know, who you used to know, or, you know, you can kind of set it up to, to manage um, and, and remind you about different relationships that you have. So it's an interesting new kind of relationship manager, but not for professional uh, relationships necessarily. You can use it for professional relationships, of course, but you can also use it for, for all relationships or any relationships. And it doesn't do anything. Um, it doesn't send anything without you. So you can sort of choose what you want to do and you can explore. It also has it finds information about the people you know, like it sees what they've updated on, on their social media so you can see kind of what they're up to. When you're working, uh, staying productive can be hard if there are distractions or if you're working at home um, and there's other kinds of uh, context going around you. So I like these apps that give me kind of ambient sounds, the sound of colleagues, for example, um, which can be nice, or Dephonic, which is like the sounds of nature. So these are just nice ways to give yourself an ambient environment for working effectively. Um, you can also do this at work if you're in an open newsroom or there's tons of noise going around you in the newsroom. You can put on headphones and, and just get a nice break from the, the hubbub. Finally, a couple of efficiency hacks. Um, I use something called Alfred uh, for Mac. They're similar tools for PC where you can use shortcuts to paste in stuff that you commonly type or to copy and paste, paste anything you've copied on your clipboard for the past few days. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do um, in terms of shortcuts and, and working more efficiently in your computer. This one, Tech Sniper, is really interesting because anything on the screen, right? if you wanted to copy and paste stuff from my slide right here, you couldn't just press Command C, right? But with Tech Sniper, I can hit Command Option T, and I can actually grab text. I'm going to do it right now just to demonstrate. And now I can go over to a text window, right? In this case, I can go over to a window, a chat window, for example, and I can paste in that text that I just copied from the screen, right? So you can copy and paste things from images anywhere online or a slide or any, anywhere you get something online, um, you, can, um, you can paste in. So I've used this a lot during the pandemic when I'm watching something on screen and wanting to take notes on something or wanting to grab something from a website or from a video. It's quite uh, come in handy quite quite a lot actually. Surprisingly, um, here's an example. You can even use it for an ebook um, type thing. Um, let's say you're you're reading an ebook, a Kindle. You can just grab grab this text. So you can't the Kindle doesn't have a copy and paste function, for example, um, or, or many ebooks don't at least. And so this one you can just grab using uh, Text Sniper and paste it in. And you'll see in this example um, a couple of different graphics. Uh, someone's seeing a graphic online and wanting to copy and paste it. You can easily do that. And finally, Bridge. If you're making introductions, if you're a connector, this is a quick way to make fast intros uh, between people, um, which otherwise can, can be a time consuming thing, finding the person's bio and their LinkedIn link and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that I find to be quite handy. Well, with that, I think we can, we can uh, pretty soon move to uh, open Q&A. I see a question in here about Gapminder, which I'll answer. Um, for online meetings, we're still meeting a lot. And I'm Zoomed out sometimes. Uh, so I, I like using a round. It's, a, it's got a, a nicer, cleaner interface, and it doesn't take up the whole screen. So the circles are just small little circles. You can still have the rest of your screen for yourself. And the audio quality is, is quite nice. It blocks a lot of the ambient sound. Um, Switchboard is another new one I'm experimenting with, which I like, which is um, you all work on, you're essentially working on a computer in, this, in, the, in the cloud. So you can all share these um, windows of a, of a document or any kind of website or anything you're, you're working on together. You can all actually see, have the same copy that you're all working on at the same time. So uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there um, uh, and open up for, uh, for questions. Um, and I'll start with the, the Gapminder question. Is Gapminder customizable? Um, so it's not. It's, it's really more for exploring data than for um, representing data yourself. Yeah, so it's, it's not necessarily a tool that you can customize and present directly to your readers. But it is a good tool for inspiration. Yeah. So, uh, well, I guess I do have a couple more here. So this is the end of the day. It's 5 PM, and you want to communicate with colleagues. You want to do that efficiently. One tool I really love these days is called Loom. 
So what Loom does is allow me to record a little video message and then email it to someone or put it on Slack to someone. And the advantage of this is rather than spending 30 minutes trying to write an email and word it perfectly, I can just record a little video. I can show something on the screen or I can just talk to the video. And then I can send the person a link. It's not public. It's just private. It's just between me and that person or me and the whole team if we're working on something together. And they can actually add comments inside the video at a certain time if they want. Like they can type in a comment responding, yeah, that looks good or whatever. Um, but they don't have to. I use this for student feedback also sometimes. If I want to show um, students something that they, they're working on and give them some feedback on it, it's a good way to give feedback on something that's natural and just speak the feedback. It's a lot more efficient in many cases than trying to write something out in detail. Um, so that's a, that's a free and easy to use tool called loom.com. Loom um, for email, uh, we all use email all the time. I, I like using Mixmax if you're using Gmail because it allows you to embed more things in your Gmail, make sure your email is, is received. Uh, also, you can send it later. If you're working late at night, you can send it the next morning. If you have email that you want to get to later, you can boomerang it back. So you can say, you know what, I need to see this next week or remind me about this next week. And it's just everything is just a button touch away. So it has a, a very helpful set of tools that let you manage email more efficiently. And then finally, if you want sort of deluxe, deluxe email, um, this is a crazy expensive tool um, unless you're a, an, an educator. And if you're an educator, it's $10. But if you're not, it's $30. So it's really a luxury tool for people who live in email. But to me, it's been a very big time saver. Um, it just allows you to work through your email a lot more quickly. And, um, and it's a luxury worth, worth paying for if your time is, is very valuable to you. And let's let's stop there. Um, I think we'll we'll uh, we'll move to uh, we'll move to uh, to Q and A. And I just want to remind everyone that the the um, the uh, handout is here um, at Wonder Tools. So wondertools.substack.com. Uh, and uh, and let's move to questions. So what questions do you have? What what would you like to hear more about? What what, what are you curious about? What piqued your interest, or what do you want to? We have one follow up. Yes. Hi, Jeremy. It's Crystal. It's me again. Two Hi, questions. One, are you a Virgo? I don't even know. I think I'm a Capricorn. Okay, it's okay. Moving on. And and then it, it was the one where you can cut and paste um, from from an image. Um, yeah, yeah. One of the yeah. things that, that, that drives me crazy, and I know everybody in here is, is sort of on the community journalism track, is you know these pesky paywalls. And so mm -hmm. there's uh, a new paywall where you can't even like cut a headline. You know what I mean? Like even if I wanted to share the article, I can't pull a quote or a snippet. Will that tool override that kind of how it does on uh, on uh, on the book page? Yes, you know? it will. Anything that you can see with your eyes, you can take a picture of because you're basically just taking. It's almost like you're taking a picture. Imagine you have a camera. It's basically doing that. Um, so that tool will work with anything that you can see, as long as you can see on your screen. Yeah. And I will give you another tip, another trick here, um, for that question of the paywall thing. So some people may not like this. So this is controversial because many of us, you know, make our living through paywalls. Right. Um, but sometimes a paywall is unfair or unreasonable. And if that's the case, there's something called 12 foot.io 12 ft.io. So what the purpose of this is basically to let you jump over a paywall for a particular article. So if you don't have a budget to pay for some complicated thing um, that you can't afford. Oh, it didn't, I didn't switch my screen, did I? Uh, let, me, let me grab the, the switch screen again here for a second. Um, here it is, 12 foot ladder. Can you see that? Yeah, so this will temporarily bypass a, a paywall. Again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that this is a good way to you know, avoid paying for quality news, which we, we, we need to pay for as, as consumers in some cases, because uh, we need to support quality journalism for it to be sustainable. Um, but, but once in a while, there's something that you know, we can't afford or it's unreasonably uh, priced. And if you feel that you need it, um, this is one way to get it. Jeremy, I have a, a this is Terry, I have a question. Um, yes, please. So we have a, um, a, a lot of young journalists here that um, um, are very, you know, I would say very stressed and stretched. Um, they're oftentimes one or, in one or two person newsrooms. I'd be curious as you think about this in incredible list of tools that you have, if you were to recommend maybe two or three to these folks um, just to get started and just to become better journalists, what might they be? 
So it really depends on the purpose you have in mind, right? So it's like, you know, if you have a, a toolbox in your apartment um, or your home, you know, would I recommend a hammer or a screwdriver, right? Well, it depends. If you're trying to hammer in a nail, you probably need a hammer. If you're probably trying to hammer, if you're trying to screw something in, you probably need a screwdriver. So, and same thing, if you want to play sports, what, what implement would you recommend to play sports? Well, if you're playing, if you're playing tennis, you probably need a tennis racket. If you're playing golf, you probably need a, a golf club of some sort, right? So I think we have to think about purpose, purpose built tools for purpose, purposes that we have. And so with that in mind, um, let's take a, um, a common scenario, right, where we're trying to uh, organize all of our materials. I think that's one of the most important things journalists have to do. And um, and we have to be able to find things, we have to be able to store things, input things, organize things, and we get a lot of information, right? And, and um, in order to manage that information, we have to be really savvy about how we organize it. And a lot of journalists, in my experience, will write stuff down in one notebook, and then another thing in another notebook, another thing on a scrap of paper, on a post-it, and a Word file, and a hundred other places, right? And then when it comes to write the story, it's hard to find that information. So this is this is a, a kind of a situation that context that applies regardless of what you're doing, whether it's political journalism or social journalism or business journalism or whatever. So given that, um, there there I would say a few options, and 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 I would encourage people to 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 do a um, a quick test. It's like if I'm recommending a tennis racket, I'd say, well, if you like this, you need a heavy, uh, a, a sort of tight, strong tennis racket, right? If you if you prefer this, you need a light, strong, right? Or depending on your personality. So the ones that I'd recommend in particular would be. Uh, Notion is, is a good one to start with. Um, so Notion allows you to organize any kind of material you have, right? So let's say you're on a beat and you have 10 different sources that you're typically in touch with and you have 10 different topics that you're often uh, um, keeping track of. You can create a simple table, right? Where you put all your information in and then you can filter it and sort it and find just what you need at the time and put in stuff in a very organized, simple way. So Notion would be a good tool for, for that. Um, and Coda is another tool that you can use for that. Um, so, so they each have some of their own quirks. It's like Pepsi and Coke. And I'd recommend people take a look at both of those, notion.so and coda.io. And they're very easy to play with. They're, very, they're free to use at, be, at, at the beginning. They're only, you only pay if you want some very advanced features. So you're, you can use them for free and just experiment. You'll see that they're very easy to use. Um, in both cases, you hit a slash key. You start with the blank page, you hit a slash key. And it says, what do you want to put in? You want to put in an image, an embed, a table, and you can start organizing things. And there are a lot of templates. So you can find a template that says, oh, this is how I organize my files. And you can grab that template and make it your own. So that's what I would say for, for someone who wants to start with just one or two things. Um, I, would, I would choose from Notion or Coda and, uh, and start to organize your materials in a more effective way for you, right? In a way that feels good for, for you. Uh, thank you. Is, is there a question in the chat? Yeah, there's a, P a question from Peter I see about a privacy cost um, to these tools. Is there a privacy cost, and and what are you, what are you giving up? Uh, he says if if you if you send all your photos to Google. So this is an important question, um, and it's not a simple one. It doesn't have a simple answer. Um, there's a cost to any tool you use, right? So um, in some cases, there's a cost to the time it takes to learn how to use it, right? So you could spend time reporting, you could spend time interviewing people, you can spend time reading books. There's a lot of choices we have. In terms of how we spend our time, I think those are some of the most consequential decisions we make, right? Is how we spend our time actually, and uh, so one of the costs to, to any tool is, is, you know, it takes a little time up front to get to know how it works, and a lot of people aren't willing to invest that, which is why they still use Microsoft Word, for example, or they still use a very old tool that's not efficient for them, and it's not. I'm not blaming anyone. It's it's choices we make, and it's difficult um, sometimes to change what we're accustomed to, to doing. But my argument is that there's actually a lot of efficiency you unlock when you get past that initial investment of time and effort um, to understand something or to try it. Um, and, uh, and, and when it comes to privacy, there's also a trade-off, right? And, and the trade-off is that, yes, if you, um, if you do not want to be known to the internet in any which way, right, you're better off not having any information on the internet, right? Uh, beyond that, there's, a, there's a, a, a full spectrum of how much information we put out there. Whether we put information of our of, of uh, that show our children onto social media, which many people do and many people don't, um, whether we put um, private information onto message boards and so forth, um, it, it's really it comes down to a lot, a lot of personal decisions that we have to make. Um, I would say that in general, there's been a lot of attention paid to the privacy practices of tech companies in the last couple of years. Um, the earlier generation of tech journalism, in many cases, was 
rah rah cheerleading. Look how great this iPhone is, right? Look how beautiful this new device is. More recent journalism, um, led by a, a lot of new kinds of tech reporting, has focused more on the the privacy violations and the misuse of data by companies. And the result of that has been that there's a little bit more careful treatment of some of the data. There's a little bit uh, better security practices that big companies have, including Google. Um, and and so I, I personally feel comfortable storing photos uh, with Google, just like I feel comfortable using Google Docs and using Gmail and using Google Calendar, right? Google has a, a hand in a lot of the digital products we use. And I've, ma I've made a trade-off and said, you know what, I I'm willing to do that because of the benefits that I get. Um, but I would also say, for those of you who feel more concerned, and, and Peter, if you're among those, there are privacy-friendly alternatives, right? You can store everything locally on your own hard drive where no one, it's, not a, it's not on the internet in any way. There are a lot of uh, services that focus on sort of privacy first. And uh, sometimes you pay a little premium for that, and they allow you to store things very locally or um, with cryptographic protection so no one else can ever see it, et cetera. And, uh, and there's a lot of those options available. So fortunately, we can make that choice now to, to be super, super private if we want to, or to trade off a little bit of that uh, for the flexibility, convenience, and, and, and cheapness of, of other free services. So those are some thoughts. Um, I, I hope that's helpful. So I would like to ask people for a recommendation of, of a tool that you find useful. Um, so let's go back to our, our poll. Well, we started with a poll. Let's Let's, uh, we do have a question. Oh, we do. Okay, okay. I'll share the poll on screen just in case you want to dive in and recommend a tool while while we're while we're listening to this question here. I'm an interloper into this crowd, but that uh, has an interest in uh, just these great tools. So uh, I want to give you an example uh, that uh, say there's a uh, list of 50 states like we frequently do, right, and some data from the 50 states like the average starting salary for each of those states. And so you get this dump that is uh, starts with Alaska and it ends with uh, Wyoming. And uh, uh, but you want to get that list into uh, number one through number 50. How would you uh, what's, your, what's the tool that you would snapshot that, uh, that, gra that graphic of all the states by alpha and uh, then, uh, then reconfigure that data uh, from 1 to 50? Yeah, so if you use Airtable, that's a great tool for this kind of thing where you can basically put a data set in, in spreadsheet form. You can even paste it from a spreadsheet into Airtable. And then with Airtable, you can sort and filter by any kind of parameter that you choose, right? Whether it's alphabetical, numerical, um, some other kind of relationship that you set up in the table, like like as you would with a database. And so it's very easy to, to sort and filter and, and set things up that way. Um, you can also do something like that in Flourish, um, which is a web-based uh, tool. Um, like Airtable, and uh, and either of those would probably be be fine for the purpose. But but yeah, I would I would use Airtable, and and that would be a fairly straightforward should be a fairly straightforward process. You could do it in a Google spreadsheet too, um, depending on how comfortable you are with that. You could do it in a Google, Google sheet. Does that help? I'm I, I'm not sure if I got the full question, but I think that I think that that gets at the gist of it. In other words, you've got to start with the data table as opposed to the uh, just the, uh, the PDF. Yes, so so you can extract data. So so if you have data in the PDF, there are tools for extracting stuff from a PDF, right? So if you search data extracting uh, PDF extractor, PDF data extract, etc., there's several different tools you can now use to pull data out of a PDF, which is an annoying format that a lot of you know, cities will use, Municipal, municipalities will use PDFs, a lot of the reporters will, will have experience with that. Um, and so there are tools that let you pull the data out of a PDF into a sheet form. Um, and then once it's in the sheet, then you can manipulate it in a Google Sheet, or, or you can put it into Airtable and manipulate it there. Um, and there, and there, there even are tools now that let you clean the data. 
So typically, if you get a data from a public you know, municipality or something, there might be some errors or, or there might not be aligned properly, the, the cells. So there are some tools that let you refine the data. Um, and that, that sometimes is an additional annoying step. But now there's some tools that let you help, that help you refine that, clean that data, um, which, is, which is a useful, a useful step that avoids having to look at every single cell yourself manually. Yeah, and actually, anyone interested in that, the, there's a, a great set of data. Data journalism is one of the subjects within journalism where there's just the most amazing resources available. Um, and there's tremendous uh, collections of resources in terms of stuff you can do use to train yourself and um, free guidebooks, free books to, to sort of learn anything you want to about sort of where to find data, how to use data, how to analyze it, how to present it, um, you know, tri uh, tr tricks to, to kind of um, avoid being deceived by data. There's a lot of, of, uh, of great resources related to, to data journalism. Uh, so the tools that people are recommending, uh, I see a few up here, um, which I'll, I'll share um, on screen. Uh, Canva, Google Data Studio, Basecamp, so Basecamp is a great organizational tool. Let me let me shift windows here um, so you can see this. And um, so we've got uh, Document Cloud Score Stream to embed sports scores. The photographer's ephemeris. That's interesting. I'd love to hear more about that one. I don't know it. Uh, Basecamp um, and uh, Google Data Studio and Canva. So lot, lots of good. Uh, Good recommendations there from from the folks here. Um, well, I think we're about at our time. I'm happy to, to answer any other questions people have if there's a final question or two. Um, and uh, also happy to, to, to hear from anyone afterwards if, if you're interested in in more on any of these things. Um, and again, if you're, if you're interested in getting the full list, just, just put your email into Wonder Tools and you'll get an email back with the full list of all these sites. So I would really like to thank Jeremy for his work in putting this presentation together, and I hope you'll join me in a round of applause. Jeremy, thank I hope you. through our technology you heard us clapping. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence. Yep, I did, Terrence. Thank you. Good. Um, again, uh, thank you for all that work. There was a ton of great information in there. I'm really happy that he's sharing that um, that entire suite of information for you to take a look at and, and utilize. Um, it's, it's important for us, I think, to continue to look at ways to do our jobs better, more efficiently. And I thought today's presentation was just a terrific um, romp through all of those opportunities. So with that, thanks again, Jeremy. Thanks, Terrence. Uh, that, concl that concludes our Radically Rural Journalism track for 2022. Thanks to all of you who joined us, particularly thanks to Jeremy and all the panelists over the last two days who have helped enlighten us on how to do rural journalism better. Also, I want to give a shout out to Alex Trombley, Jeremy Robarge, and Jessica Garcia for the help with the tech needs, or our tech needs uh, during this conference. As you know, this is never easy to put on. And I'd like to close by saying that I th we have, I think, as a, a responsibility to be better stewards of this profession for so many important reasons, not the least of which is the preservation of democracy. You heard from speakers during the last two days who are making great contributions to that work, particularly as it relates to reaching more audiences, being more equitable and inclusionary in local news coverage, and better representing the diversity of this country. They are doing this work the same way we've always done our work, by telling stories of people and holding the powerful to account. We need to continue to embrace these efforts because surely our future depends on it. Safe travels home, and thanks so much for being with us.